the unique opportunity of going through puberty at the age of 29. <laughs> and it was very strange doing it the second time, I assure you. Remember those feelings the first time you kissed the opposite sex or, or held hands on your first date? That feeling of electricity that went through you? That's what I felt as a 29-year-old man. And you know, I had so many experiences in homosexuality and, and sexual ones and emotional ones. But when I met the woman who I fell in love with, who would become my wife, just holding her hand felt like nothing I had ever experienced in homosexuality. And it felt right. And for the first time in my life, I felt normal. And that was a wonderful feeling. You know, people around us in our church, because my wife had also come out of lesbianism, they, they delighted in seeing us walk through this process. And our pastor thought, you two are going to need a little help. And he started counseling us from our very first date. And that man counseled us every week until we married. He stood by us and walked along with us. And so now, uh, I've been married 10 years and have two sons, and life just gets better. It's not free of struggle. None of us are promised a life free of struggle. I have to realize that there are certain triggers to homosexual temptation. I would say probably 90% of the time I don't experience these temptations. But if I'm under stress, if I'm traveling too much, if I'm feeling insecure about my masculinity, if I don't feel close to my male friends, that old enemy comes back and sits on my shoulder. And I need to walk in maintenance. You know, I always have to laugh when gay activists say, you haven't changed. If you ever have a homosexual thought or feeling, you're still gay. And my answer is, you can say whatever you want. You haven't walked in my shoes. But what I can tell you is, for 24 years of my life, even the thought of heterosexual interaction was really nauseating to me. And now I've had a successful marriage for 10 years, have a very fulfilling emotional and sexual relationship with my wife, have fathered two sons, so something has changed. And they always shut up. And I say, you can't explain transformation in a test tube. It's only explained by the evidence of a changed life. Thank you. I, too, would love to be talking to you today about the wonders. And I know that as individuals like John Polk and myself and the many others that we know that are out there begin to share the story of the power of Christ in our lives and how he's brought us out of very negative situations and made our lives something purposeful, it gives people hope, it gives parents hope, and it gives those that struggle with homosexuality hope. I was born in Southern California, and I, unlike John, was raised in a very Christian home. Another thing that's very important to understand about my upbringing is that I have two older sisters that are 10 and 12 years older than myself. So you can imagine what my father that owns sporting goods stores in the Southern California area had in store for his only son. I was going to be the best football player, the best baseball player, the best basketball player, the best soccer player. I was going to be the best everything that my father could possibly make me. One of the problems was is that I didn't have many of those same interests that my father desired for me. I remember specifically at the age of nine being on a hunting trip with my father. This should have been a time where I was accepted and ushered into the realm of masculinity. I remember being on that trip. Specifically, I hit a bird down in the middle of the field. We were surrounded by 15 or 20 other men. I went over to pick that bird up and knowing that it needed to go in my bag behind me, it was still alive that I had to kill it. So I attempted to step on its head, and from across the field, my father would yell things like, just pick it up and wring its neck, you sissy. And so those were times of what masculinity were represented for me. I had no desire to be like my father. I had no desire to hang out with other men. I was verbally ridiculed. My father would call me Michelle or refer to me as his third daughter, thinking that ultimately that would make me tough, that that would push me into the realm of masculinity. Instead, what it did, it caused me to fear masculinity, and I became what most of you would know as a mommy's boy. I retreated back to the safety of hanging out with my mother and my two sisters, and that was what was comfortable for me. At the age of 11, there was a man that began to pay a lot of attention to me. It was wonderful. 
since I grew up in Southern California, he took me to Disneyland, he took me to the latest movies, he taught me how to surf. It was an incredible relationship. He reaffirmed who I was. But the problem was, at the age of 11, that attention turned sexual. So from the age of 11 to the age of 18, I was a victim of sexual abuse. And I can say that to you today because I know that no 26, 27, 28-year-old man should have been doing what he was doing with me at the age of 11 and 12 and 13, but it didn't feel like abuse. Proverbs 27, 7 says, The man that's full loathes honey, but to him who's starving, even what's bitter tastes sweet. And I was so starving for male affirmation and attention that when this man offered me the bitterness that the world had, it met a deep need in my life. So very early, I continued to grow up. I was in junior high and high school now. It, involved with this man in this relationship, I had a father telling me that I was less masculine than everyone else. I began to hear the words that we hear on campus today, fag, queer, and sissy. I came to understand what those words meant, and that label went right on. And I lived from a very early age as an identified gay individual. From the age of 16, I remember calling myself gay and referring to myself in my own mind as a gay man. I invested in the homosexual community from that age because I realized this is where I found my security. This is where I found my identity. So growing up in Southern California, it was very easy for me to invest in the homosexual community. I lived in that community for 12 years. Also, going to church. But the problem was is the church that I was attending did not speak about how men and women walked out of homosexuality. I would hear the testimonies of drug addicts. I would hear the testimonies of alcoholics. I would hear the testimonies of adulterers. But never did I hear the testimony of a man or woman that had walked away from homosexuality through the power of Jesus Christ. My church didn't talk much about the issue. So what happened in my mind when I was sitting in the pews is, well, this church doesn't care about my issue. God doesn't care about this issue, so why should I stay involved? I instead found the homosexual community was completely embracing, and when I walked into those gay bars and was around those gay individuals, I felt like I had purpose, that I finally had hope, and that I finally had a group of people that understood what I was feeling and who I was. So as I said, I completely invested in the homosexual community for 12 years. And homosexual men, as all men, whether you're heterosexual or homosexual, are focused visually. So I wanted to become the most valued commodity that I could possibly become to that community. I was working out two to three hours a day. I was doing injectable steroids. I was bulimic because I wanted to eat, but I didn't want to gain weight. I wanted to have that perfect men's health body because if I had that, then I was a valued commodity to the male homosexual community. So after living there for 12 years, buying into the argument that I was born homosexual, that there were 10% of us in society, and that I needed to fight for my rights and fight against what the church and, and other people were saying about who we were, I began to march in gay pride parades and began to fight for the rights of my people. I did all of that. Living there was on this treadmill of life, of the working out and the steroids and the throwing up, all the while longing to be married longing to have children, but flushing those dreams far away from my life because I didn't think they were ever possible for who I was. It wasn't until I was 28 years old, I had gone back home to visit my family. I wanted to stay connected to my family. My sisters were going on. They had married godly Christian men. They were having children. I remember holding my nieces and my nephews. And longing for that in my own life but knowing that I couldn't attain that because I was born gay. I had so believed that issue. I remember going home one Thanksgiving to visit my family. I found myself in a gay gym, and I was headed towards an illicit situation with another man. We got out to his car, and he said, I'm sorry that I've led you on, but I'm a Christian, and I'm trying to walk away from homosexuality. That was the very first time that I ever heard such a thing in my entire life. He said, well, will you at least talk to me about this? Because I began to be venomous with this man. I said, what are you talking about that you can walk away from homosexuality? Don't you know that you were born gay? And if your God can change you, then why are you here? And why are you struggling with this? And why are you dealing with this? This doesn't sound like a God that I would want to serve. He said, well, will you please get in my car and talk to me about this? So 11.45 at night, we were driving around, and this man began to tell me about another godly man 
that had pursued him with the love of Christ and was sharing with him about how his relationship with his father may have played into this. This man was also sexually abused and how that might have played in to his component of feeling as though he was a homosexual individual. And these things started to ring true and he began to talk to me about this man named Jeff. Midnight was coming at this point. We pulled into a parking lot. We were sitting there talking and my heart started to be drawn to what this man said, but yet I couldn't trust it because I knew to trust it meant that I had to trust that God that I felt had let me down. And then I had to come back to the Christian community that I felt didn't understand me and actually hated me for who I was. So he began to tell me about this godly man that was helping him to understand the root causes of male homosexuality. Jeff this and Jeff that and Jeff is challenging with me with this and all of a sudden his eyes got really big and he goes, oh my goodness, there's Jeff right now. And I knew at that point that there was something happening in the realm of whatever. And he invited Jeff over and that started a five year godly mentoring relationship with this man named Jeff Conrad that haunted me when I didn't want it with the love of Christ. I would move from city to city. I wouldn't give this man my Floridian address. He would track me down. And he would send me birthday cards that would say, I don't even know if you're getting this birthday card, but I want to let you know that I love you, that God loves you, and that change is possible. So finally, after living on that treadmill, looking at myself in the mirror one day, I thought, you know, I only have myself to blame because I wasn't finding what I was being promised by the gay community. I was promised that I could have a relationship that would last. After going through relationship, after relationship, after relationship, never finding what I wanted, selling myself, being arrested for prostitution, I thought, you know, I only have myself to blame because there's this man saying that there's something different for me. So, as it says of the prodigal son, when I came to the end of myself, I picked up the phone and I called Jeff Conrad and I said, Jeff, if you can be this faithful to me, surely the Jesus and the God that you know can be that much more faithful. I want to come home and I want to give this a try. So December of 1989, I left homosexuality. And I'd love to say that from that point, it's been an easy, incredible, God-serving story. But the reality is that's just not the truth. The year of 90 was hell on earth for me. I had known homosexuality since the age of 11. By that time, I was 28 years old. It was all I had known. I didn't know how to live a life that was chaste. I didn't know what to do. I would go to counseling with a Christian counselor. He would challenge me. I would feel vulnerable. I would feel opened up. And on the way home from counseling, the only way that I knew to comfort myself was to put myself in the arms of another man. And that's exactly what happened for me. I finally came about to find a group of individuals, a ministry known as Exodus International, and a church that knew how to love gay men and gay women and help them walk away from homosexuality. So I invested in that. And like, like John said, and as Dr. Dobson said, it wasn't an easy process. It was a very long, ugly, hard process. But you know, the Lord gives you the strength to be faithful when you need it. And I found that strength in who he was. And I continued to walk that process out. And as John said, I too uh, long to be married and long to have children. And through this process, about four years into it, I began to realize that there was an individual that I had met. Her name was Angie, that I began to feel quite differently when I was around her. And, and John said and alluded to that very thing, you know, puberty is hard enough once, but to walk through it twice is a very difficult thing. And Angie and I began to feel very different around her, and I realized that I had fallen in love with this girl. So 1994, December 4th at 4 o'clock, I married Angie. It was an incredible experience. Here was the Lord restoring the years that the locusts had stolen. And the story gets better, and I have one last thing that I want to share with you. After years of attempting to have children, my wife and I didn't think it was possible. She herself is post-abortive, so you can imagine what was running through our minds. She would say, well, I've killed two children. Why would the Lord allow me to serve and to bring up another life? And I would say, I was gay for 12 years. Um, I've gone against the very creative order that he designed. Why would he ever bless me? He wants to continue to punish me. But people in the church wrapped their arms around us and said, that isn't how God works. If he's put that desire in your heart, he will somehow fulfill it, whether it be through adoption or whether it be through granting that life to you. So we moved here to focus on the family after I had, uh, believe it or not, taken a job as a youth pastor. Can you imagine a man with my story? I have to tell you that through that process of desiring to be restored and be a youth pastor, which is a, a lifelong dream of mine, 
Uh, it wasn't an easy process. I had to give my testimony to the parents. I had to give my testimony to the students. I had to give my testimony to the deacons. I had to give my testimony to the elders. I had to give my testimony to the pianist. I mean, I gave my <laughs> testimony to anybody in that church that would listen. But as I said, it was a church that believed in the life-changing power of Christ and said, who are we to say that you're not the man for the job? So they gave